Welcome to your introductory video for this lecture series on science fiction. We will be unpacking what science fiction is all about, as well as the ways that we can look at science fiction in this course and in all of your courses. Specifically, this section will have three videos. First, it will have this video, an introduction video that will explain the basics of science fiction and give you an idea of where it fits into speculative fiction at all. The second video will have to do with Australian science fiction, and it will highlight what it means to have fi science fiction that is Australian, what exactly makes it Australian, how it is different than your standard or conventional science fiction, and then finally, we'll have a third video that deals with your primary and secondary texts that have been selected for your given lecture series. So let's start talking first about the word. Science fiction. It's actually two words, right? We have science and we have fiction. And they couldn't be two things farther from, well, from the obvious. If we think of the bookstore, we walk in and we see science fiction, we know what it is. But if we look at the words on the page, science and fiction, and we separate them, I think we'll notice that there's a pretty clear contradiction there. So I'll follow this for a second. Science fiction can be etymologically unpacked with a lot of ease, right? It's all about precision. It's all about our understanding. But as we get into science, we have to think about what science is all about. And science is about epistemology. It's about finding truth in a world that it's very hard to find truth in. So science, especially Western science, is caught up in a certain kind of method. We know it as the scientific method. And it is a method that does give us some semblance of truth in our consensus reality. Science in most of the global north, but also worldwide, usually considers the scientific method and the scientific community to be one of the most best ways for us to understand something to be a fact. We'd consider it more reliable than an eyewitness, and definitely twice as reliable as a crystal ball, if not more. And its developments can be witnessed over your own lifetime or over the span of since the genesis of the scientific method. And that in itself has confirmed the validity of the methodology for finding some observations or judgments and making decisions in our world. In addition, many of you viewing this video, I'm telling you something you already know. You learned it in school, and so did I. But I wanted to bring us through that track just so that we're on the same page here. Fiction, on the other hand, is quite a bit different because it's necessarily untrue. Fiction is formed or contrived fabrication. It's a material that contains the imaginary. Even the most realistic of fiction does not, def does not actually reflect the real world. It does not mime it, and it does not present us the real world. The most it can do is create another world, one that we can compare to our own. That seems to be the least scientific thing of all time, maybe. Maybe not of all time, but it's certainly not what we would consider scientific. If we bring these two terms into constellation with one another, it results in a bit of a paradox. Well, not really. You see, together these two ideas make up science fiction, a branch of literature that imagines what scientific methods may reach toward, and what they could have been had they gone down another road. Perhaps the most speculative of all speculative genres, if I had to sum up this whole video into just one salient point, it would be that science fiction starts from a question. The same as any science experiment. A question that starts with, what if? What if humanity was destroyed, save for a single fleet of ships in space, wandering the galaxy with the hope of finding the promised land, the legendary 13th colony known as Earth. Our Earth. 
what if aliens arrived, uh, they were peaceful, and we decided to learn their language? What if there was a time-traveling person called a doctor with two hearts while spending most of his time traveling through what we perceive as linear time, decides to square off against evil and set things right. Whether I'm talking about Battlestar Galactica or Doctor Who, science fiction is something we can all recognize. And science always starts off with an imagined question, speculation about what can be, and then it follows through with an experiment. Science fiction tends to start at the same point. I think now is a good time to turn to some definitions of what science fiction is. So first we're going to turn to the Oxford Dictionary of Literary Terms, the third edition. According to them, science fiction is a popular modern branch of prose fiction that explores the probable consequences of some improbable or impossible transformation of the basic conditions of human or intelligent non-human existence. This transformation need not be brought about by a technological innovation, but may involve some mutation of known biological or physical reality. For example, time travel, extraterrestrial invasion, or ecological catastrophe. Science fiction is a form of literary fantasy or romance that often draws upon earlier kinds of utopian and apocalyptic writing. The biggest takeaway that we can have from this definition is that definition is not, in any really clear way, a form of realism. I think we could all agree on that before we even read the definition, though. Science fiction is, of course, very speculative. Perhaps the most speculative part of speculative fiction. It has been described as an imaginative fiction, and that makes a lot of sense. Unlike realist novels, science fiction does not pursue verisimilitude or attempt to parrot or reproduce our reality. On the contrary, science fiction seems to be concerned with portraying anything but the everyday life that we experience. If it does relate to it, it's always with a very big change. I don't think that this definition goes far enough, so I'm going to turn our attention to a different definition. According to Adam Roberts' seminal science fiction, science fiction can be termed as a literature of cognitive estrangement, as a literature of alterity that does not necessarily escape a reductive sense of difference as dangerous, as materialistic symbolism, and as a nostalgic historiographic mode of writing. He draws this conclusion from three different competing definitions of science fiction that he explores. In the following, I'm going to explain some of the important aspects of this definition to unpack what it means. Right now, you probably read that and you go, well, I don't really know exactly what he's getting at. And that's all right. I certainly didn't either. So if we take the first part of his definition, science fiction can be termed as a literature of cognitive estrangement. And we try to pick that apart then we have to think about what that means. And to do that, we need to separate the cognitive and estrangement into two different binaries. So if we if we look at the origin of this work, which is from Dark of Seven, cognition is the rational or the logical aspect of science fiction that focuses on comprehension. So often our science fiction narratives have a justification or plausibility to them that requires us to understand or comprehend what's happening. Popular films like Arrival are all about that kind of comprehension, that cognition, as it explores the story of a linguist trying to understand an alien language. Similarly, 
Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse Five, a very beloved book in the American context, explores how to understand a temporality that is outside of the human one. In both of these instances, cognition is a clear part of the narrative. Now, the other aspect might be the harder one to understand, estrangement. Estrangement comes from Brecht's work, and it is a form of alienation. It is what alienates us from our own familiarity or everyday life. Science fiction strikes a balance between the two polarities. We can understand something, but still feel alienated by it. So we understand that, and let's turn to science fiction as a literature of alterity then. Science fiction as a literature of alterity is enacted through the novum, the source of cognition and estrangement. The novum is also the material aspect a lot of times in science fiction, so I'm going to get to it a bit later on here as kind of a core component of any sci-fi text. Uh, so we'll, we'll get there in a second. But sci-fi is also a literature of alterity because of how caught up it is in notions of difference. Despite the strong attachment of science fiction to its own canonical conventions and its tendency to often accept dominant ideological or political belief systems, so often we see reproductions of dominant systems in our sci-fi, the genre has always still held some kind of sympathy for the marginal and the different, space aliens among them. In Robert's work to define science fiction, he lists several examples of how, even though science fiction was predominantly a group of young, white, male readers, and even authors, that demonstrated remarkable sensitivities on the subjects of gender and racial diversity as well as contact. Science fiction as a nostalgic, historiographic mode of writing is rooted in how it uses the future as a frame to view its text and to make it historical, by using recurring historical narratives or bigger unsolved problems of history, and by putting them to task in the genre. As Roberts argues, science fiction does not project us into the future. It relates to us stories about our present, and more importantly, about the past that has led to this present. You'll notice that I left out one part of Roberts' definition, and it is that material component that I was talking about earlier, the novum. And we're going to look at those core components that make a science fiction text what it is. Think of it as a kind of checklist that allows us to understand what a science fiction text is, but also think of it as a way for us to explore and look at what the meaning of writing in science fiction is all about. The novum comes from Latin, meaning new, or new thing, to refer to the point of difference within a text. It is a conceptual, but more often than not, also material embodiment of alterity, of difference. It's the point at which the science fiction text distills the difference between its imagined world and the world in which we all inhabit. More obviously, in the time machine, it's, uh, it's the time machine, it's time travel. In Star Trek, it's all those spaceships faster than light travel and all those other technological advancements. Consider the texts that have been selected for this part of the lecture series. What are the novums in those texts? What do they do to change the narrative? A sense of wonder is probably one of the biggest, most important aspects of any science fiction text. It's usually tied somewhat to the novum, but it is always produced on the content level. It can, however, be produced formally through the means of interspersed narration, alien styles of discourse, and so on. Typically, a sense of wonder can be experienced by the characters within the story, who are relying on certain narrative conventions from genres like adventure stories, or it can be in the face of technology that surprises the characters and perhaps readers 
through its rapid innovation, development, or how it drastically shifts politics, social life, and so on. Star Trek strikes me as one particular example of what we think of when we think of science fiction that has both. It has the narrative conventions of a lot of adventure stories. It takes the idea of traveling with a ship across the ocean and transplants it into the sea, bringing with it the same colonial desires that we have in our original canonical adventure stories. Science fiction, which so often deals with alien landscapes and vast galaxies, nebulas, black holes, and other such things, all point towards a sense of the sublime, of viewing the world as something greater, or the universe as something greater, peering into something that makes you feel smaller. If you want to know more about what the sublime is, we cover it in much greater detail in the gothic section, which you probably have already watched. Science fiction also regularly includes framing that is locked onto the future, as I have mentioned before. This doesn't require much elaboration, but it is a very key distinction to make between science fiction and other genres. There's a bit more flexibility in most genres when it comes to the temporality that is being depicted. Sci-fi is one of the exceptions. Even when sci-fi is set in our present, which is possible, think of War of the Worlds or Frankenstein as examples, it points towards a hypothetical or future technology that stretches into notions of future existence rather than the present. H.G. Wells's view was that science itself aimed at prophecy, and it shows in his many seminal science fiction texts, which he called science romances. He argued in an essay called The Discovery of the Future, and if I am right in saying that science aims at prophecy, and if the specialist in each science is in fact doing his best now to prophesy within the limits of his field, what is there to stand in the way of our building up this growing body of forecast into an ordered picture of the future that will be just as certain, just as strictly science, and perhaps just as detailed as the picture that has been built up within the last hundred years to make the geological past? Similarly, science fiction texts are constantly intertwined with developing technologies beyond where they are now, within that future frame. Some people, Roberts included, point toward the nostalgic end of the spectrum. These texts are rarely correct in their forecasts, after all, and the problems they address are usually more akin to problems that we have faced before or that we are facing now. Referring back to my example of War of the Worlds, it is so much not about aliens of the future or future encounters with aliens. It's about colonial encounters. It's a critique of colonization that is very clear at the beginning of its text. As Roberts argues again, science fiction does not project us into the future. It relates to us stories about our present and more importantly about the past that has led to this present. The future frame allows us to have some critical distance from the present and to refer to the potential outcomes for decisions being made now or decisions that have been made already. One aspect that jumps a bit away from what we might call fantastic is the pursuit of plausibility and material realness in science fiction. I would contend that much like magical realism, some aspects of realism are core to science fiction, but in this case it mostly is that plausibility and the attempt to draw real seeming conclusions from our technological present or social present to illustrate futures that contain some of those very real things. As Roberts argues, it is part of the logic of science fiction, and not of other forms of fiction, that these changes be made plausible within the structure of the text. This means that the premise of a science fiction novel requires material, physical rationalization, rather than a supernatural or arbitrary one. 
this grounding of science fiction in the material rather than the supernatural becomes one of its key features. We always expect there to be a reason for something in science fiction that can't be reduced simply to its magic, and I'm not saying that to belittle the fantastic at all. I simply mean that science fiction often has some kind of justification, not only within its content, but one that is anticipated by its audience. That's why technobabble has become so popular in sci-fi texts and films. Now that we basically have a good idea of what science fiction texts have going for them, that is, what makes up a science fiction text, I want to compare them to the other genres that we discuss and modes in this course. Magical realism is first up to bat, and to me what they actually have in common is the stuff I mentioned just before, a kind of material plausibility. In the case of magical realism, though, there is this sort of assumption that everything is being played straight, that the magic is already real, whereas in science fiction, the writing itself seems to argue for the plausibility by detailing how things can happen in many cases. A significant difference is also the future framing of science fiction. Although magical realism can be future framed, science fiction is very often always future framed, right? Both magical realism and science fiction are very political genres, so that's something they have in common. However, once again, one of the obvious things about science fiction is that its content is often so different from magical realism. And while there usually is a clear-cut connection that reaches Earth in magical realism and science fiction, those are, of course, not always the rule, and science fiction tends to go very far away from Earth, while magical realism tends to be rooted in it. It's important to note that the biggest distinction is probably how science fiction is focused on the hypothetical, while realist traditions are held up and reinforced by magical realism in a much different kind of way. Time travel, faster than light travel, artificial intelligence, and a variety of other technologies that are more or less hypothetical can be portrayed with projections that may lack some scientific validity, but what matters in a text like this, a science fiction text, is the plausibility for the intended audience. And in that sense, it can be pretty similar to magical realism, which is also supposed to seem plausible. However, in a magical realist situation, as I said, the magical elements are usually taken a bit for granted. In sci-fi, what we might consider magical is definitely not taken for granted. Comparing to fantasy, there is perhaps no better place to start than Arthur C. Clarke's three laws. They are as follows. Number one, when a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, he is almost certainly right. When he states that something is impossible, he is very probably wrong. Number two, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. And three, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Fantasy is obviously very similar to science fiction. You can even tell from these laws the idea that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. That certainly seems to apply in actually quite a few different fantastic novels, where there are ancient civilizations whose technology has transcended. And that's not even including some of the similarities between these aspects that are important to a science fiction novel. Senses of wonder are pretty common in fantasy, and certainly the specific tropes of sci-fi could crop up in pretty much any fantasy text. But obviously fantasy novels and magical realist novels have certain tendencies that are a bit different than science fiction. Science fiction might have some of the same kinds of phenomenon, things that seem almost magical, but they're always cloaked by the scientific. Sci-fi and fantasy may be common bedfellows, and they even have kind of their own unique merging in science fantasy. And on the global market, their communities in the Anglophone world are often somewhat conjoined. Like if we think of the Aurelius Award, for example. Science fiction and fantasy, when they come together as science fantasy, they are in a specific kind of niche where the elements of magic and the fantastic coincide alongside those tropes from science fiction. 
So instead of thinking how they might be different, which I hope is already at least somewhat obvious from the introduction to fantasy video and the specific tropes that I've laid out here, as well as the specific genre conventions, let's think about where they meet at science fantasy. Science fantasy stories are often set in different universes or worlds that don't really have a connection to Earth at all. Usually science fiction does, but science fantasy often does not. Some obvious examples of science fantasy include Star Wars, The Matrix, the Thor series in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Orson Scott Card's Ender's Game, Transformers, Stephen King's The Dark Tower series, and so on. Although they can be connected to Earth, as several of those are, uh, they often mix the mystical with the magical and the technological. And there are plenty of obvious things that can stick out when we look at science fantasy. It can have both the magic wand and the spaceship. And certainly those are, those are obvious things we can pinpoint as differences between science fiction and fantasy as well. However, I want to signal you to be wary of that kind of distinction, one that's as simple as saying there are laser beams in sci-fi. Because you can't reduce sci-fi just to those tropes, those specific motifs or recurring objects or even the setting of space. Magical realist texts can take place in space. So can fantasy texts. As could a gothic novel. So these kinds of ideas of, of what can be in a sci-fi novel should really relate more to those conventions that I've highlighted earlier. When you do your own analysis, be careful not to simply say, well, it's sci-fi because it has spaceships. Another distinction between both fantasy and magical realism between science fiction is the epistemological systems that are on the attack or discussed within these different genres. So if we think about the Eurocentric conceptions of science and how we find truth versus non-Western epistemes, we can think of a genre like Afrofuturism, which we would probably normally tie to science fantasy due to its reliance on different systems outside of the Westernized concept of progress and technology and so on and so forth. But I think that would be missing the point, right? So often, we think of science fiction as, as having this kind of specific Eurocentric bias, but the conventions that I've listed don't suggest that that is necessarily the case. But if we do think of science fantasy, often plausibility is basically tossed out the window. So when you evaluate texts or even a genre like Afrofuturism, which might use different ideas of plausibility, it might be hard to place it within a generic set of of rules, but that's okay. The genre is only one kind of point of analysis that we can look at. In any event, the tension between science fiction, the uppercase, and science fantasy is one worth exploring, even in our own texts, which vary in their conceptions of the scientific and magical at least to some degree if it comes up at all. Terra Nullius, which some of you might be reading excerpts of or the full text, could be taken as science fantasy due to some of its elements as could excerpts from Heat and Light, specifically Water, if you happen to be reading those. Likewise, if you've been reading Illuminae, it incorporates the figure of zombies, self-aware artificial intelligence, and faster-than-light travel that might strike us as more magical or fantastic than technological. By comparing science fiction to dystopia and utopia, we might actually find that they share a lot more than these earlier genres I've discussed, especially because they share one common element, which is that framing towards the future. Sci-fi is not particularly aligned against either dystopia or utopia. It can be concurrent with or supplementary to, subordinate, parallel to, or subordinating one of these genres. The sheer dynamism of the future and the relations between the generic tropes of both genres make it very easy to say that there are utopian sci-fi texts, like Star Trek, many Asimov stories like The Bicentennial Man or iRobot, Scalzi's Old Man's War, Arrival, Interstellar. And we can make the same kind of list for dystopian sci-fi texts, like Vonnegut's Player Piano, Pierce Brown's Red Rising, Orwell's 1984, or Huxley's Brave New World. We can think of the films Minority Report, Looper, Blade Runner, or we can think about Stephen King's The Dark Tower series again. 
A science fiction text that chooses to engage with dystopic or utopic elements often includes elements of both, which is also something we regularly see in those genres because they so often mix with one another. Novels like Frank Herbert's Dune or the post-scarcity dystopias of Brave New World, Le Guin's Hanish Cycle, and even The Matrix all have their fair share elements of both, depending entirely on your frame within the story. Climate fiction is another topic I will delve into, but more with regard to the next video, which will be about Australian science fiction. I suggest you watch the Cli-Fi Buzz video before you do that. And it will definitely get its due course, don't worry, it will be in the Australian session. Climate fiction rests on the barrier between sci-fi, dystopian, utopian, genre mixing, and it definitely includes discourses of climate change and natural environmental responsibility, which ties it directly to our present. Last but not least, we have my favorite genre if you, or rather my favorite mode, if you've watched and listened to the podcasts or other videos. So comparing to the gothic, we can see that science fiction is focused on one of the opposite processes of a traditional gothic text in that it doesn't focus on the central system of the present and its maintenance of it, but rather it takes those ideas and attempts to extend them, and it can confirm that same order. Uh, but it often can go against the perceived culture or society as well. Now, the Gothic text can do the same thing, but it's all a matter of framing here. There are, of course, moments where the Gothic and science fiction cross, since, as we discussed in our first ever recording, Frankenstein manages to contain gothic, sci-fi, fantasy, and even dystopic elements all rolled into a single source text. The points where the gothic and sci-fi most clearly brush up against each other, though, are in the frictions and spaces that are associated with the punk genres. Whether we're talking about eco, steam, cyber, or one of the millions of other punks that are surely out there, and you might be wondering why. Why is there such a, a unique resonance between these two? And it's often because technology is extended and focalized. There's a novum in these stories, but they often borrow very heavily from detective noir style tropes that are part of the gothic mode. So when these ideas and conventions come together, we can see exactly where gothic and sci-fi meet. Of course, we could also point to some of those wonderful, sublime moments, right? We could think of those as being another area, a sense of wonder that can be evoked in both texts that can parallel them as well. However, I prefer to focus on these other aspects because I think they're a bit more worth biting into. Some texts that might strike you as being both gothic or in the gothic mode as well as science fiction are some of those that might be in this course. Perhaps the subjugate, or perhaps television series like Terra Nova, where broader problems of this greater society are reduced to examples of detective stories. We could also think of films like The Minority Report or Twelve Monkeys. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope that it helped you a lot. When we talk about science fiction down the line, in the Australian context, we're going to look at how national conventions of literature can be used. And at this point, I'd like to just make sure we have a final summary so that we have some idea of what science fiction is if you glazed over at some point during this video. Science fiction should be understood as a genre that approaches the problems of the present with a forecast of the future. Science fiction is all about difference, alterity, and it's all about addressing some of the issues and triumphs that come with it.